next award. is the Ruth Patrick Award, and it is to honor outstanding research by a scientist in the application of basic aquatic science principles to the identification, analysis, and or solution of important environmental problems. And this is a really fun one to give because this is going to John Downing. His nominator was Mike Pace, and I'm going to keep my comments very brief because John is going to give a presentation afterwards and talk about some of his work. Um, John uh, is, has been known for his excellent work on, on looking at agricultural eutrophication in the Midwest. One of the things that he's known for is really looking at broken systems and how they can be fixed. He's an educator that really walks the walk, bringing his, his students into his research, um, and he's going to tell you a lot about that. The other thing I have to say about John is he is one of the most lovely, kind, fun, amazing human beings you will ever meet. And if we ever have another meeting in Santa Fe, and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and you have nothing to do, and you want to go to Abandros, you will also see that he is an exceptionally good dancer. So without further ado, please welcome John Downing. of me up there. Oh, I'm well, I, I, I was stunned by this award, as you can imagine. I was actually chair of the uh, awards committee for about a decade, and so I should be kind of used to all this, but I'm, not, I'm really not. Um, and I have given some advice to, to awardees, and so I'll, I'll try and follow that advice. But first, I just wanted to thank Debbie for such a great presentation that she gave, and I am, I will be proud but apprehensive to take up the sash and tiara in a couple of years. Oh, although she's told me that she's going to be buried in it, which, <laughs> which is a little frightening to me. So, so, so please at least live out your term, won't you then? Let's see. What do I have to do, Carlos, to get it? Not other Carlos. Oh, hang on. In my excitement, I've got rid of my glasses, so I see nothing. So. that little exercise just cost me four slides. <laughs> Those of you who know me know that I can clip through these things in a pretty big hurry. But thank you, of course, is what I need to say first. The advice I gave to awardees always was something like, your job is to tell where the science came from, showing as many embarrassing photographs of yourself and people you love and respect as you possibly can, and then toss in a little bit of science at the end, if you, because most people like to at least be reassured that you do something. So let's start with Ruth Patrick, though, because it, it, what a phenomenal scientist. And I have to say I am so honored to be given an award for doing something practical that helps people. And she was certainly a cornerstone of that sort of work in the aquatic sciences. She had the sense that biological diversity was a key for understanding environmental problems. She had a profound interest in diatoms, which I share. I started with diatom work, uh, and all their characteristics and how they react um, to various environmental perturbations. In fact, she founded the Department of Limnology um, at the Academy of Natural Sciences to do pollution studies, not just sort of basic limnology. Um, and she's been a major inspiration to limnologists and oceanographers um, for decades. So when I heard from Debbie on a Sunday morning, which scared me in itself, uh, that this award was to be given to me. I, I control controlled and looked on Google Desktop to see what the first first publication in my collection was, and it was this one, which was is, is quite amazing to me. Ruth Patrick was second author. Um, it was published in the uh, in um, uh, in PNAS, but had to do with net plankton and, and, and contains many different kinds of coincidences. It was on some of the rivers I work on. It shares our modern interest in regional phytoplankton. Cites the work of Lois, Tiffany, and Ken Carlander, who used to be colleagues of mine, and um, were, uh, were in the departments that I inhabit at Iowa State. And it was really interesting. It, she was really interested in nutrients as stressors. Um, here, Jean, are some data on 
uh, nitrate concentrations from this very paper. I thought you might like those. They were high in the 40s, too, so lots and lots of nitrogen. We'll get to that in just a second. The first uh, Patrick publication that I poured over and cited was this one, which I'm sure a lot of you saw, have, have seen and read. Um, and it was interesting to see her take on how uh, the diatom community could be altered by various perturbations and gave inspiration to a lot of great work in, in many different uh, people and, and many different kinds of organisms. So the next thing I'm supposed to do is say how I came to this work and, and show some embarrassing photographs. And I, I hope, I, I'm pretty sure I've done that, at least embarrassing myself. So uh, my day job does biogeochemistry, global limnology, a bunch of stuff like that. But the, some of the work that I love the most applies theory to fixing things, as Debbie said. Um, my mother used to joke that by the time I was 12, I had every appliance uh, in the house apart. And she said, after I put them back together, some actually worked. But the work that I really love uh, applies theory to fixing those perturbed aquatic systems because it's the water I love the most. I have a foundation in comparative limnology. My dad was a frustrated limnologist, and we lived in this, uh, I don't know, you can kind of tell where this is, by the, this is North Dakota to Minnesota gradient. I lived in that little town on, on your left, and uh, in the summertime lived in that sunshine thing on the right-hand side. And as we'd go past all these little uh, different kinds of systems, my dad, who really was a protozoologist would say things like, well, I'd say, why does that one stink? It was because of saline sulfate pan. And he'd show me the different kinds of systems that we'd pass as we went from west to east and then sadly from, uh, sorry, uh, from east to west. Um, so I'll show you a picture of my family. This is uh, just to show you that I have a background in aquatic science, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, there, there I am on your left, um, starting a budding limnologist. And, um, uh, you can read about the rest of, of my family. They're a little s less scary on the left than they are on the right. Um, those of you who know me well will notice right away that I'm the only one with a burger on my plate, and um, I've, I've, I've retained that interest as well. I grew up on the bottom of lakes, uh, quite literally. I was a certified diver when I was nine years old, and uh, um, I actually grew up on sort of the bottom of the old Lake Agassiz, and so I sort of have come to this stuff naturally. Uh, now here's a really embarrassing photograph. I, this, and this is, um, it's a kind of ironic that I was, I was brought to limnology, I was saved from music and brought to limnology by oceanography, which is, makes me somehow perfectly fitted to this organization, perhaps. I was a working musician. I was an undergrad music major. I took a marine biology oceanography course, and I got really interested in littoral zonation and wondered why nobody's doing littoral work in freshwater. So I kind of went home and uh, worked in the freshwaters. And it's kind of odd, I think, that a Midwesterner would recognize interest in limnology via oceanography. And I'm afraid I, I keep slopping across that boundary all the time. Anyway, my master's degree uh, did everything on a little lake in northern uh, North Dakota. And uh, it was, I was advised by John Paterka, but this is a lake that um, was alternative stable state kind of lake. Uh, nobody knew about that. It was called senescent. Um, the question was, why is it like this, and how do we fix it? So I did everything. Everything you see there, I got my first publication, which uh, was in limnology and oceanography on groundwater flux into the system. And I was really interested in groundwater. And here's a picture of me destroying a septic system uh, before I really knew how they work by injecting 20 kilos of sodium chloride into uh, poor Olive Benson's septic system. And we came back to take our samples and the piezometers a couple of days later and found a backhoe. <laughs> Did my PhD work at McGill University with the people that I call the four pillars of limnology in, in Canada at the time. Bill Leggett, who was interested in the application of limnology to fisheries. Yap Kalf was very interested in how nutrients um, uh, translate into phytoplankton composition. And uh, Frank Riggler, whom you all know, had a very strong interest in predictive limnology and how it can be used for management purposes. And Rob Peters, of course, on the left, who was my PhD supervisor and was uh, sort of the, the king of, of predictive uh, limnology, the predictive end of theorization. Ah, here are the really obligatory embarrassing pictures. And I'll leave this up here for a little while. And some of you, I'm sorry to those of you for whom I couldn't find really embarrassing photos, but there should be um, plenty that you can recognize in here. Just to tell you that I was very lucky to grow up uh, scientifically in an environment jam-packed full of wonderful scientists doing brilliant things. And I, some of these people are still here around the room. Many are spread all over the world doing great science. And I feel very lucky to have been exposed to the science that they did, much of which was quite practical or had practical 
bases or applications, unlike mine, which was completely, had no applied or interesting element to it, and I published papers out of it that have never been cited by anyone, but I did, I at least was inspired by their work. Um, Rigler and Peters were really strong inspirations to me because, uh, and any of you who have not read this book should do so, I thought it was supposed to be online available, but um, uh, in this book uh, called um, Science and Limnology, uh, Peters and Rigler said limnology really needs to solve environmental problems, limnology should address big environmental questions, and theory derives from predicting, interpretation is from wondering, things like why, how, come. You know, how come, what for? But science builds theories, and strong science builds theories that make predictions that you can use. My first job was at the University uh, of Montreal and the Laurentian Station, helped build a group there in aquatic science. Um, Bernadette de Nelalul, whom you see there some, some years ago, supplanted me as sort of the practicing limnologist, so I fiddled around with things like sampling design, benthos, secondary production, and uh, mammalian and forest ecology when the mood uh, suited me. Then things kind of started going crazy. I was working with Bob Howarth at a scope workshop on Block Island when I got a job offer from Iowa. And I, you know, why Iowa? But anyway, it became really kind of interesting. And we were working on uh, regional nitrogen budgets and looking at NNP flux to the North Atlantic. Um, and you may wonder why I was a person that should be involved in such a workshop. But um, anyway, it seemed to work out. But I uh, got the call. And I was instantly, once we'd accepted the job, Marcia and I, to go there, um, we made a really big jump in comparative limnology from an average of four parts per billion total phosphorus to 125 parts per billion, which was rather frightening change. On the top you see the Station de Biologie, and on the uh, bottom you see uh, some lakes around Cher uh, Cerro Gordo County in Iowa. This is how I looked at Ames uh, from Montreal, kind of thinking of it. And Ames, is, I, at the time, I was sort of hoping it was a coastal city, because I love the sea. Well, it is kind of a coastal city in that it's, when it's flooding, it's only two to five days, uh, hydraulic days from uh, New Orleans. So uh, we fancy ourselves as a... Uh, uh, and, and I got quite involved in some marine studies in the Gulf of Mexico with a little help from my friends, some of whom you see around the room here. And thank you very much for... Um, breaking me into this sort of work. It was very exciting. Jean, Nancy are here, I know, I haven't, I haven't seen Bob. And a few that are a little bit more inland in my watershed. From the work that Bob and others, many others, uh, had done, we began to realize that, uh, I began to realize pretty quickly that the area I was working in, uh, although limnological, was pretty important to marine ecosystems. And here you can see sort of the slices of nitrogen and phosphorus budgets that are supplied to the Gulf of Mexico. Proud to say we're a big exporter of nitrogen. And uh, my state alone is responsible for 11% 11, 11 of the Gulf of Mexico nitrogen, which um, we're doing our best to fix. Um, we're also, we also supply 2 to 3 percent of the nitrogen to the North Atlantic, if you can even believe that. This is the kind of system I used to work on when I was in Canada, and this is the kind of system I began to work on. And so I thought for the balance of the little time left to me, I would tell you a few things that I've learned from repairing and monitoring lakes like those. Uh, very green ones, very active ones, very broken ones, but they do I mean, when do you learn about your car? When it's working perfectly? You learn about things when they're broken. So that's, um, I, I'm very happy to work on these systems. Okay, number one thing. I learned that some of the most critical marine environments may be watersheds, lakes, and rivers, as was actually mentioned not too long ago in, in the same room. We found that uh, a whole bunch of the nutrients come from a little tiny slice of the watershed. And so uh, we can go about fixing those systems pretty well. Fixing lake uh, water quality locally for phosphorus also helps really a lot with nitrogen abatement, and uh, we're hoping that we can help out in that regard by fixing local systems. Watershed plumbing, we're finding, is much more important than land use. Another thing we learned is that limnological theory isn't just theoretical at all. There are, uh, we've done a dozen, a dozen diagnostic restoration studies, and we use off-the-shelf models created by limnologists around this room, and there you see a bunch of their names. Um, the theories work, and they're bringing improved water quality, legislation of water quality, even in a place like uh, my uh, wonderful agricultural state, um, and they're bringing recreational and economic benefits to society, which I'm very happy about. I learned that bacteria, microbes of all kinds, sewage and manure are everywhere. I had actually learned how to say man manure when I uh, moved there. It's, it's actually pronounced manure if you're in the Midwest. Um, but the bacteria are just, yeah, just try that, just repeat it. 
<laughs> no, 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 <laughs> please. Um, we've done pattern sampling. We find bacteria are just everywhere. It's quite an amazing thing, and antibiotics and all kinds of other jazz is out there, too. We learned that nutrients move in unexpected and strange and bizarre ways and forms. Rain and dust supply enough nutrient to our lakes to make them hypereutrophic. We have about 120 parts per billion of total phosphorus in rainfall and dry fall. Groundwater supplies more than twice enough nutrients for hypereutrophy. Um, gaseous ammonia, NHX, is moving around so fast and being sucked in by lakes and streams. And those are all um, the kinds of uh, pathways that are really interesting. In this one lake, 31% of, um, uh, of the phosphorus actually came in through rain and dry fall. And they were talking about building a dome over it. But we fixed it in one place. I learned that people are really important nutrient sources, even in agricultural regions. These are caffeine. We use these caffeine tracers, and I don't know if you've used these. They're really fun because um, nobody in here doesn't consume a caffeine, and urinary caffeine is well known. Uh, concentrations are from doping studies in, um, uh, in athletics, and so we can back calculate sewage dilution rates. Uh, anytime we look at a storm drain, we find caffeine in it. Um, sewage dilution runs about 50, uh, 50 to 2,000 fold, although in the region I work in. We learn, okay, this is a poop index. Okay, this, well, this is a phosphorus output of people. It doesn't mean anything else other than that. Actually, we tried to get some idea of what the, the uh, equivalent human population density of the state might be by calculating how much output of fecal material there is and so on. But anyway, the bottom line on this is that if you back calculate like this, the population, uh, uh, human population equivalent of this little state of Iowa isn't 3 million people, it's 45 million. Um, and it has a, a, a human density equivalent of about 300 per uh, square kilometer, which looks a little bit like downtown Madison, Wisconsin, uh, a little bit lower than um, all of Puerto Rico. We learned that it isn't just about plankton and nutrients. Uh, it's about fish. Uh, it's a pretty clear experiment um, uh, and with, no, uh, with no stats uh, needed. We learned that some of our most valuable land, in quotes, might be water. Uh, lakes in my region, even with poor water quality, generate $50,000 per hectare per year. And it's really hard to know what the value is of, uh, of these things because we don't buy and sell the lakes, and we, it's hard to know what water quality is worth if you don't work with economists. And so I spend a lot of time working on that, and that's been really uh, kind of exciting. Um, we found, among other things, that non-market value, using non-market valuation techniques, that limnologists and actual human beings uh, value the same variables, and, um, and that's kind of exciting. And we can calculate things like how much is good, a good secchi disc breeding worth, and how much is nice swimming uh, quality worth, and we can translate it into jobs, which all of us know right now is pretty much the only thing that's going to sell our science locally. Last thing I want to do is say thanks. Uh, thanks to everybody. I want to say th uh, thanks to Michelle Wood and the Hazel Patrick Awards Committees. Thanks to my local awards committee, who I think may have had some hand in, in uh, inciting Mike Pace to action. And uh, some guesses at who might have written letters. Uh, don't be embarrassed if you didn't. I don't blame you. Um, <laughs> and thanks especially, though, to Aslo for sustaining an environment where, uh, you know, a guy with a strange background can learn enough to maybe do something pretty useful. Uh, another thanks. Thanks to Marsha. She's in the third, <laughs> third row. And um, she's put up with uh, my science for a long time, but if she was kind of predisposed for this, because you can, if you have a look, I was going to say contrast our father's pictures. Uh, <laughs> 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 she kind of came by this, this, this world naturally, but thanks just the same, Marsha. Um, and lastly, thanks to Ruth Patrick. Thanks for the foresight to work on society's pressing environmental problems. Thanks for being the role model that saw the importance of the theory-practice continuum that allows us to do things that are not only theoretically exciting, but do some good for all those people who supported us and paid for our research grants and have paid for our, our schooling and all that other kind of stuff so that they can get some satisfaction out of it too. And lastly, thanks to all of you for your attention. And, and I know I'm between you and cold beer, so that's all. Thanks, you guys. Now you really are going to make me cry. Stop that. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Jing. <laughs>